uh, when when uh, there is time to mull over things like you know uh, uh, how would they understand uh, how would they understand um, you know a different future? I mean, how a different How do you dream of the That's a very bouncy question. There is a book on the world that is in Jimmy's class. But uh, I think uh, there are two uh, different situations. And uh, so one situation that you refer to uh, is the situation of strife. Where there is a strife and there is a war. Uh, that's where you have to see that there is a strife where they do not have war. And that will be seen as an enforcement as a meeting. So what happens in, even in that context when there is strife and there is a long period of unemployment? Uh, is that the institution first to be intact? All their cultural institutions, social, music, theatre, everything. Hello, hello. So there do not be a sense of loss, or that distinctness is actually very much intact. In fact, those are the moments of heroism for the workers. And uh, one of the ways they sustain, at least a section of workforce sustains, uh, is through their access to village lands. That they return to those villages. And in fact, that is. मुझे लगाने नहीं आता ऐसे लगा बस इसको देना हाथ में ये इसे दे इसको हाथ में रख दिया वो हमेशा ऐसे पे रख तो जाके उसके 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 है ना लेजर ऐसे लगा और इसके हाथ में दे दे बस बोले किस लिए तो रिकॉर्डिंग and uh, so there are people who are asking who are these people so that itself is a sign that they have become pretty much invisibilized that I mean, there was a time when they, they didn't have to tell who they are if there's a strike it is a worker strike it is a textile worker strike you don't have to tell um so that um, is the question now now as far as dream is concerned um it's a pretty much situation of hopelessness so this is what scholars have recorded now there is a sense of fear and loss of power and capacity that they do not think of themselves powerful anymore they are pretty much displaced from the working class areas they have spent generations um obviously there is a, also the other side i mean there is a pro there are problems with their workplace uh, they are unhappy with there are you know there are the problems especially with tuber clauses so there is a wide ranging problems and yet there is a sense of distinctness uh, which they themselves recognize and the society to recognizes and this is where now it's a bigger experience now the experience is not mere that i feel oh i you know i don't have money anymore uh, but the sense of pride with which you actually stood up in the street corner that actually con moral confidence has gone now you can't do that anymore because anyway nobody cares who you are i mean you are invisibilized anyway there are no auxiliary no auxiliary uh, uh, jobs around factory uh, employment uh, i mean they really have nowhere to go to i mean you are really painting a very deep picture smith <laughs> okay okay let me okay because there are several you know threads in that particular question of course a people will have to take up something for their livelihood okay so there are what is known as the informal jobs so the security guards that's the you know biggest avenues for the for the retrenched workforce uh, then courier boys okay 
but none of these jobs even have basic income basic respect and they are exploited like to the hell now for those workforce now all for those who already enter those occupations they probably don't feel it that way but for those who had a different history altogether of association of work being something now for them it's extremely difficult to enter into those jobs obviously it's i mean people will have to do something or the other but the point itself is that that experience is not that different because that work does not give them the distinctness which the other work gave so they are pretty much like any other invisibilized laboring bodies in the city Sir, uh, my question is uh, jobless. On uh, one hand, jobless is increasing, and on the other hand, uh, magazine is also increasing. So, what do you think about this? So, what is in, what is? Uh, uh, jobless is yeah. increasing, and on the other hand, magazine is also increasing. Okay. So, what do you think? About? Okay, that's a good question. uh i don't think migration is necessarily increasing that i mean one maybe the little flow may go up and down uh but there are different kind of job that are always there in the city so there is a joblessness obviously i mean now post demonetization there is a new kind of a joblessness that we you know there is a we were calling there was a jobless growth so there is a growth in the economy and there is, it is not producing jobs uh now we have a situation where the economy is not growing and even the jobs are not growing okay uh yet the movement of the people is pretty much uh, in the sector we call as informal sector so migration is happening um people come to the cities every day uh, to the bigger cities for sure uh, and they are get incorporated in all kinds of informal jobs so as far as uh, the big city like mumbai is concerned because that's the city i know well uh you have security guard i mean there is this is a little you know anecdote from the one of the security guard union leader and he said for an every hour there is a security guard that is born in mumbai so you have a new construction of a building you need a security guard you put a new atm machine there is a security guard so that's one big thing and then the courier boy stuff now with zomato uber you know, all kinds of uh, flipkart amazon you have this is the biggest booming sector so which mean, doesn't mean that there are no jobs but uh, the kind of jobs i am referring to were very specific and very tiny actually in that sense yeah hi uh, okay. oh okay uh, that's not a question actually but a slight comment on when you were talking about uh, the soldiers labor and uh, you know this is labor and you said that it's a separate variety Because uh, with soldiers' labor and soldier himself feels proud to do what he does, right? But I think uh, that's based on an assumption uh, that he feels the way he feels, uh, and it could be subjective as well. The way one looks at one soldier's job. In my experience, talking to soldiers, because I come from Mumbai, which we have spoken to many of them. I have never seen a soldier taking pride in saying that he works in Mumbai. Every time I talk to them, they just say that they are waiting for two, they are two years to finish up so that they can leave to Mumbai. But the fact is that it's something kind of an emotion, emotional uh, value that the state expects the soldier to do so, and this kind of suppose uh, he also kind of internalizes that idea. Okay. but does not necessarily mean that he is uh, the way you look at it like spiritually into his work and so on and so forth but the idea that the prime minister uh, prime said that the prime minister is romanticizing the idea of a span of scavenging labor right but those are two different ideas in one and in the other right in, in case of a man of scavenging and his profession being uh, romanticized that has a political mileage to it both do have a political mileage to it i i do agree there but i'm saying is that the idea that one is more spiritual and he considers himself that he is doing something great is very subjective in that sense yeah i think uh, sorry yeah i don't think uh, yeah i didn't refer to spirituality i think i was just only uh, you know commenting on that spirituality part spirituality part uh what you said i'm not disputing the point, point is obviously there are uh, different context within which one can look at it um even within the factory workers that i study if you really ask them what kind of are they happy with their work obviously they would say they are not happy so there were lots of problems inside the factories because there is this massive humidity within which they have to work for long hours 
it's absolutely sweating and it's like completely drowning them out okay so that part will remain but outside that particular space okay so for so them there is a distinctness that they can take pride in i'm not saying that everybody has to take a pride but by and large these are conditions that allow them these particular laboring bodies to take pride in the kind of work they do now kashmir it's possible i'm not disputing that part that they have to take a pride in if they have to um, you know take orders from the state and perform that particular kind of labor i would say okay uh, the only comparison i had is the, broadly speaking the way the society looks at it and the way that particular laborer and in this case i am treating the soldier as a laborer that's it okay and then some in by and large it's a mutual thing so even though they may not necessarily take this great pride in being mill worker but then there are these wider associations that actually make them this particular distinct laboring bodies and similar the reason also i actually picked up military as a category is to talk about how actually society and the laboring bodies themselves treat each other and the case of manual scavenging where actually they perform more or less absolutely basic necessary functions for functioning of any modern society and yet how does the society and the state respond and that's these are contradictory ways yes yeah. this part where uh, as far as modernity modern part of the laboring body is concerned that this expectation that once they enter those kind of industries uh, all their gender caste or religion all these become irrelevant that did not happen okay but i am not in fact i am what i am saying that we need to find a common thread that connects everyone and which is that being part of that organized labor force give them the distinctness so there are problems within them among themselves there are lots of problems who will do what kind of work okay uh, so this is where i wanted to make that distinction but um, as far as these uh, communities are concerned whether from western maharashtra or konkan region okay so these are the two major places where workers migrated to mumbai also uh, parts of up and historically speaking from mid 19th century this is where workers have came uh, to work in the textile mills now uh, only in a very small way what has actually uh, been able to support this kind of joblessness uh, are the kind of what is known as village associations in mumbai so these are uh, because the way historically migrations have taken place and then continues to take place uh, is via caste kinship and village networks so you have absolutely laborers almost from the same caste and same village almost sometimes within the same families they come to the city and historically this is the route within which they have come to the city and in the city what they have done is they have formed associations based on those villages and some of them have survived but by and large the whole system has collapsed uh, so the one i studied is from western maharashtra uh, kolhapur sangli satara some of these institutions have survived and they are able to give some kind of comfort to the jobless workers or their children more importantly their children because it was a cyclical thing that uh, after the father their one of the male members would come to the city and then the retired person would go back to the village and retire in the village uh, so some of them have survived but by and large the institutions have pretty much collapsed 
uh, also because of the real estate pressure that people have sold those particular places in central Mumbai and they have gone to the far away suburbs and there is a pretty much uh, you know they have gone into different directions and uh, now what has happened is because of the housing kind of demand that has uh, been going on for the last 10 years uh, like just last week around 3000 flats were distributed by the new government in Maharashtra uh, so these are 3000 workers who benefited from the subsidized housing scheme so overall now I think my estimate is roughly 15,000 workers have uh, been beneficiaries of this subsidized housing scheme roughly 9 lakh rupees they have to pay for a for that particular flat in Mumbai in central Mumbai yeah. knowledge about where exact who are these people who actually go into become dance, uh, dance bars in uh, you know bar uh, as far as women workers are concerned when they started losing job particularly 50s 60s uh, they try to find different avenues and this khanavali they call that say these were women run messes and where the male workers would come and have their three meals uh, during the day uh, so this is one of the annapurna is i think there is a documentary called annapurna uh, which actually talks about these jobless women workers uh, who are then incorporated into different kind of um, uh, services. Uh, but uh, this kind of situation that I explained is there is a massive transformation where the entire factories and everything smaller institutions around them have closed down. And in such a situation, then what do you do? Then, I mean, that's a different inquiry. Uh, I mean, so there are two parts to what I study. One is how they respond to joblessness, and the other is how they experience joblessness. And uh, because you know, for your livelihood, you have to find some new work and do something, or do political mobilization. Uh, but the other part, which is more important and which connects to what has been discussed here since morning, is how do you experience the joblessness? And the experience is that their distinctness is gone as a worker and uh, you are pretty much an invisibilized uh, worker which is like so many workers because you need worker for each and everything to run any city town whatever and yet you don't recognize their labor and similarly these people whose labor was once recognized have now entered into the domain where these bodies pretty much have absolutely no special distinction
on to our next session. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Shafali Cha and Dr. Nabi to give our speech. Uh, let me introduce the chair. Dr. Shafali Cha teaches at the Center for Compatible Literature at NCU and has a PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago. She has coordinated a recently published paper on feminism titled Indian Women with Dr. Navita Mukhe. She is interested in questions of political representation, sovereignty, and feminist movement. Um, thank you for that introduction. and. Um, uh, I want to start actually by thanking Professor Thirumal for organizing such an interesting event with such a range of papers, all of them, uh, you know, uh, productive of really great discussion. Um, and a personal thank you for allowing me to introduce my longtime friend, um, Navarita Bokel, to you. Uh, she teaches at the Center for Women's Studies at JNU. Uh, she's of the University of Hyderabad um, and of the English and Foreign Language University. Uh, she did a PhD um, from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, and her book um, came out last year. It's titled Unruly Figures Queerness, Sex Work, and the Politics of Sexuality in Kerala. Um, today, I believe she's presenting new work that she's just started to think about. Um, and uh, I, I think the kind of thread that connects Navita's interests. Um, from what she's already done and what she's done recently is really an interest in elaborating um, what we might, what she calls in her book um, a vernacular politics of sexuality and how to think about that in different ways. Um, so without further ado, I invite her to present her paper which is titled Encountering the Body shifting cinematic practices in India. Thanks uh, to the SU School and Trimble uh, and all uh, the co-organizers uh, for inviting me and thanks to Hari uh, for the introduction. Uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, keeping the concerns of time, I'll just uh, read the paper. Uh, so, uh, the paper title Encountering uh, the Body, uh, Shifting Cinematic Practices in India. Let me just quickly pull up the PowerPoint. last two decades in India, we see the emergence of films in different, language, in different languages that have the potential to jolt us as viewers because it brings us intimately close to bodies on the edge. Many of these films shake our sense of equilibrium because of its formal strategies. Uh, the delirious play with movement and stillness that disturbs the ordering of space and time. I seek to unpack how and why these films insist on the materiality of the body in a time period when proliferating media practices render bodies mobile, virtual and duplicable. This paper is linked to some of the key questions in a new project that I am developing on shifting modalities of protests in India, technological changes and new cinematic practices that unmoves us from our comfort zones. Through an engagement with the kinesthetics of cinematic forms and bodily practices that disrupt customary boundaries in the scenes of protests, I want to examine how the political is being recast in the last two decades. In this paper, I will not be able to develop the links to political protests, but I want to signal towards how a careful engagement with cinematic practices might allow us to rethink the configurations of the body in a changing media ecology. To 
investigate how cinematic practices reorder sensory regimes, I will mainly focus on a selection of three films, all three are Malayalam films, Agam, uh, Inside from 2011, uh, directed by Shalini Usha Nair, Shavam, The Corpse uh, from in 2015, uh, directed by Don uh, Palathara, and Kari, uh, which translates as Black, uh, from 2015 by Shanavas Naranipura. And a shorter discussion of Urudu Sekali, an off-day game uh, by Sanil Kumar Shashidharan, which came out in 2015. All these films are part of recent economies of film production and exhibition in India. They are low-budget films made using digital technologies that circulate through online platforms, independent community-based viewing spaces, multiplexes and film festivals. Uh, there are certain tendencies I locate in recent films. Uh, I'm sort of trying to find some shifts that you can, uh, you know, locate in these recent films. But I, it's not like I'm posing them as a radical break. But my aim is to see how these uh, shifting media technologies make us encounter the body differently, uh, both an, at an individual and collective level. To unpack the fundamental question about how representational practices materialize the body, we need to pay attention to the interweaving of different aesthetic forms, uh, such as painting, photography cinema, performance art and creative writing and in my analysis I also try to see like how cinema is referring back to you know referring to other mediums. So I'll begin uh, by focusing on Shali Usha Nair's film Agam, uh, a retake on the Malayalam novel Yakshi, which was written in 1967 by Malayatu Ramakrishnan. Uh, here the spectral uh, presence of the Yakshi is evoked by our practice of filmmaking that play upon the intangible relationship between human and non-human worlds, the capacity of the camera to capture accelerated or slow down movements that cannot be processed by the human eye and its power to thus alter our perceptions of time and space. If we think about it, what is a yakshi other than a parishion uh, that bewilders us because it breaks the accepted coding of bodies in linear time and space. Agam, uh, it, one of the early films in Malayalam that used digital filmmaking technologies uh, gives a new life to the much retold yakshi narrative. Uh, the film explores the tense relationship between the architect Srinivas whose face is disfigured after a car accident and his wife Ragini. Uh, Srinivas suspects that his attractive wife Ragini is a yakshi and persecutes her. Agam injects horror into the space of the modern home and conjugality by dwelling on spatial tropes both exterior and, in and interior. The title of the film itself signals its investment in spatial practices. Agam, what is inside, uh, in distinction to Puram or uh, what is outside. Uh, it could also refer to the architecture of the house itself, the bedroom for instance, which is often seen as more inside than the living room. Uh, in this film, the tenor of Malayatu's Yakshi undergoes significant changes and yet it continues to focus on the masculine subject for whom sexual desire functions as both utopic possibility and a project doomed to failure. Unlike the novel Yakshi and even the earlier filmic adaptation in 1968 titled Yakshi, uh, where the narrative does not completely dispel the possibility of the existence of Yakshis, in Agam the narrative places faith in modern psychiatry and gives credence to the diagnosis of Srinivasan as a violent uh, man who suffers from a personal history of abandonment. Yet. There is a residue of the unexplainable, a disturbing excess that haunts this world and breaks this framework of medicine and pathology. The uncanny makes its presence felt primarily through the way spaces are captured. It does so by dwelling on the eerie elements of ordinary settings, the still shots of dead bugs in a living room, chairs that brood at night after an office empties. An old dilapidated uh, single screen theatre is a setting for one of Srinivasan's unexpected meeting, uh, meetings with Ragini. Uh, the play of light and shadows and the technologies of projection uh, that produces bodies on screen seems to mirror the chimerical potential of Ragini to appear and disappear. It is at the foundation... Uh, okay, can you all see the image? Should we switch off one of... Is it possible to switch off that light? Like? Because some of it is darker in Yeah, that's better. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. 
It, it's at the construction site of a multi-story building that Srinivas first meets Ragini and that's uh, this site. Uh, Srinivas is an architect. Here again the structure acquires an eerie quality, the dim lighting, extremely tilted camera shots, bats in the sky, sounds of crickets and then the apparition of a lone woman in a sari. That's the first meeting uh, between them. Thus the film takes us to the realm of ghostly traces and incomplete captures. Uh, the charge relation between Srinivas and Ragini as well as the spectators and the screen is mediated via the workings of the uncanny which is activated through an unmooring and dislodgement of bodies and objects. Uh, for example, in one of the climatic sequences of the film, uh, Srinivas confronts Ragini and asks her why she leaves no footprints. Uh, she loses her temper and says that she is a demon. In this long take, uh, the camera stays focused on the space of the living room, but the space is activated and rendered mobile in a dizzying fashion as Ragini swirls in the room. This is a uh, shot from that sequence. When Srinivas follows Ragini to the next room and attacks her, the camera stays static and fixed on the space of the uh, aesthetically assembled living room. So the camera stays here while we hear sounds from another room. Uh, we only hear cries from Ragini from another room. Our vision is still fixed in this empty space, a space of the home rendered unhomely at many levels. My methodological intervention on the study of embodiment and cinema is that I focus on changes in filmmaking technologies, the aesthetic shifts that this may produce and its transformative potential in materializing bodily encounters. While there is an agreement that filmmaking and exhibition practices have shifted from the era of the celluloid to the digital, the key question is to echo Tom Gunning and I quote, what makes the new new? As Gunning observes and I quote again, technologies function not simply as convenient devices but refashion our experience of space, time and human being. He draws on the uncanny as a term that mediates between the extremes of astonishment and automatism produced by new technological interventions. Uh, Gunning relies on Freud for his analysis of the uncanny uh, using the German term uh, das uh, Unheimlich which literally means unhome-like. Thus he argues that new technologies such as photography, the moving picture or phonogram evoke not only a short-lived wonder based on unfamiliarity which greater and constant exposure will overcome but but also a less dramatic but more enduring sense of the uncanny, a feeling that they involve magical operations uh, which habituation might cover might cover over but not totally destroy. This uncanny potential of technological changes may disturb familiar domesticated modes of perception. In Akam, uh, this uncanny terrain ruptures the everyday ordering of gender and domesticity. In this film, we are suspended in the shadow world of uh, life and death, the human and the zoological, the everyday and the fantastic, as in the last scene of the film, shot in breathtaking colors and spectacular detail. The camera moves unhurried in its pace and captures the details of every strand of hair, the gradations of lush green, uh, the translucent wings of a dragonfly, the pattern of light shimmering on water, uh, an enchanted world of plants and insects that lie submerged under water to finally rest on uh, Ragini's inert body. Uh, the film ends, this is the last shot of the film, with a top angle shot of Ragini's body amidst rocks, weeds, trees and the reflection of the blue sky clearly stilling the moving images. In an interview I conducted in 2019 uh, with uh, the director Shalini Ushanayat, uh, she mentioned the link of this scene to the pre-Raphaelite uh, painter John Everett Millet's uh, painting Ophelia on the scene uh, of the Ophelia's death in Hamlet. As you can see here, if you compare the two images, there's much in common in terms of composition uh, and technique. Uh, John Everett Millais uh, began the background of this painting in July 1851 at Evel Surrey. Uh, in accordance with the aims of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, he painted with close observation of nature. Millais quickly found, however, that such intense study was not uh, without problems and was moved to remark in a letter uh, to Mrs. Thomas Combe. And 
right quote from the letter he says my martyrdom is more trying than any i have hitherto experienced the flies of sare are more muscular and have a still greater propensity for probing human flesh i'm threatened with a notice to appear before a magistrate for trespassing in a field and destroying the hay i'm also in danger of being blown by the wind into the water and becoming intimate with the feelings of ophelia when the lady sank to muddy death together with the less likely total disappearance through the voracity of the flies certainly the painting of a picture under such circumstances would be a greater punishment to a murderer than hanging and quote everett's notes on the painstaking process of the making of this painting points to the process of mediation as one that has preoccupied artists in different in differing points of history in this letter and the note that follows we get a glimpse of the labor and bodily risks involved in techniques of painting that aim to produce very similitude the pre raphaelites exposure of naturalism they aim to undertake detailed studies of the natural world and the human body by conducting on site examination and sketches of botanical specimens was an attempt to challenge existing conventional paintings of that time and had the effect of shocking many spectators because of its excessive realism in a painting like ophelia the detailed and realistic portrayal of the natural world accentuates the haunting quality of the scene of death so the gesture of capturing the real world is entwined with a preoccupation with making us perceive our surroundings in an enchanted fashion and this double move is palpable in the last scene of agam thus digital filmmaking practices take us back to some of the fundamental questions posed by different image making practices such as painting uh, photography and early cinema at different historical junctures technologies of mediation shift and yet there are significant intermedial exchanges that we can uh, track so the next section i have actually titled it recording death and this is a discussion on uh, shabam cops uh, so shabam uh, a, third, a 63 minute film by don palatera is a slow paced recreation of the scene of the death of a young man uh, thomas itikora set in a middle class syrian christian household in the short time span immediately after thomas's death and leading up to the funeral this black and white film is a low key almost dispassionate recording of the interactions of the people who gather for the funeral ceremony these sequences of death and mourning in which as multiple reviewers mention the corpse is the central actor is guaranteed not to make even the most sentimental of us shed a single tear in fact the sound of repeated keening uh, prayers and hymns for the departed soul both by the people who have gathered and through a music system playing the devotional song maranam varumurnal orkuga martyani remember mankind uh, that death will come to you one day it sort of plays on loop and almost grates on our ears because it's repeatedly playing uh, but the realism of the film its itinerant camera movements and documentary quality has a peculiar force of zooming in and out to make us pause and dwell on everyday objects that are both ordinary and yet gather a force field around it there are multiple shots where the camera uh, snakes its way through parts of the house and the surroundings pauses or the subjects uh, you know like ordinary things like a broom or a bucket or a wall the many shots just like that like you know where the camera is simply uh, you know st uh, st uh, almost still frames in that sense the still almost meditative quality of these frames sit side by side with other scenes of everyday exchanges talk about marriage and where to buy ornaments uh, debates on the education system in london and india updates on a cricket match the list is long and eclectic it also includes niggling accounts of the dead man's deeds uh, his predilection for alcohol comes up as well as a loan he did not pay uh, that he did not pay back uh, the scenes of the film alternate between long takes of people's conversations and interactions and impressions of the surrounding spaces uh, for instance in one sequence we are first place outside the room in which a conversation is taking place almost as if we are overhearing it and then as one of the women uh, turns around the camera slowly traverses the house and places this is inside the room then it moves closer to the group and we watch the sequence which is a squabble between family members on money spent for the funeral and related arrangements the camera does not focus on any of them it hovers around and we feel we are observing these conversations without making our presence known and it, it does not allow us to align with any person uh, we see only parts of their bodies the balding head of one man the agitated hand gestures of another as the argument heats up the camera moves 
moves on to a still frame of the patterns uh, of leaves uh, as light uh, filters through a translucent curtain, uh, followed by another full screen shot of a spider weaving a cobweb. It is those it is through these long takes that choreographs colliding sensory impressions that the film draws attention to how cinema, especially the presence of digital media technologies such as phone cameras, uh, through which we are constantly recording the private and the everyday, uh, can orient us towards the world. Shabam was a film that draws attention to the presence of a range of media technologies in our day-to-day -day lives. Acts of living and dying are presented here as assembled via the network of media forms. Uh, the rituals of the funerals are interwoven with the rituals of photography and digital filmmaking. We see two men come in with a tripod and a heavy bag with two cameras which they take out and set up to start shooting. A highly emotional scene uh, sequence follows uh, in which a young woman who also appears to have had an intimate relation with Thomas hugs the dead body, weeps and asks him to wake up and speak to her. Uh, Thomas' wife also uh, seated next so both the women are seated next to the uh, you know to the to thomas body and they uh, you know she watches uh, the other woman and she also starts weeping uh, but uh, in this staging of two women crying facing each other with the dead body in the center uh, so much so that they seem to be performing grief for each other there are two camera persons moving around zooming in and recording the scene with a still camera and a digital camera so you see all these camera presences in all corners of the of the frame thus rather than setting up any presumption of direct access the film is invested in exploring the multiple modes through which a scene is framed and mediated the film underlines the material and technological processes through which the real is fabricated along with this there's a repeated reminder via the still frames that despite all these devices the world will escape capture later a long sequence follows of the process of taking post still photos photographs with the dead body, now costumed in finery with gloves and a cross uh, in his hand, laid out in the open casket. Uh, we see the photographer take a portrait of the corpse, uh, surrounded by a large group of people, and then uh, we see so this is the image uh, that's being taken by the photographer where he poses all of them and uh, and then we see him uh, you know sort of zoom in to check the quality of the image uh, the camera zooms in and we gain a greater clarity on the captured image on the digital camera screen uh, reminding us of the instantaneous temporality of the digital camera processes its capacity to record and display simultaneously it is the still image within the moving image uh, that makes its way into the poster of the film. Scholars have speculated on how the absence of time lag between the mechanical acts of clicking or recording images and viewing them as well as the proliferation of image making technologies especially because of the mobile phone camera and other cheaper and more portable options for cameras has altered practices of image production and reception. Uh, for the purpose of this paper I am merely pointing to how a film such as Shavam is preoccupied with the exploration of the shifting relations between technologies and the fabric of the everyday. Thus the film continually draws our attention to processes of mediation, laboring bodies and technological devices that materialize practices of performing grief. Uwe Skoda and, Bridget, uh, and Bridget Lettman in their study on the practice of post-mortem photography taken of the departed for the private use of the bereaved in rural and urban settings in central eastern India observed that and I quote, today we encounter an even greater increase in the practice of postmortem photography in central eastern India due to the easier access uh, to the relevant technology, particularly to mobile phones. We have noticed almost an explosion of images of the deceased in line with the general proliferation of photographs of all genres. Unquote. It's important to note that in the time period of digital filmmaking and photography, where the mechanical operations of the camera has radically changed, a film like Shavam returns to some of the fundamental preoccupations of the photographic medium, uh, the evidentiary power of the photograph as an index of the real as well as its capacity to take us to the terrains of memory and uh, spectrality. Uh, Shavam and Agam are not films that I am pointing to as exceptions. There are many recent films in different Indian languages that are participating in these global shifts uh, in aesthetic and technological practices. Sanal Kumar Shashidharan's Aurudhuste Kali, an off-day game, also showcases a similar aesthetic practice. The fine 
final sequence of the film is a police and robber game played by a group of men high on alcohol. This game is the climax of their day out, their break from routine on election day. This sequence is a long take with no cuts where we see rules of the games being laid out, roles are signs, the robber spotted and punishment spelt out by the Thirumeni, uh, 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 referring to an upper caste Brahmin man who is also playing the judge in the game. The camera stays focused on the interactions between the men as we witness the horrifying turn of events where in the staging of the game a Dalit man is stripped and hung to death by his drinking companions. Four of the men keep repeating this is only a game Dasa as they gang up together and physically overpowers and hangs to death Dasan, the Dalit man whose identity is clearly flagged in the film. We watch every maneuver in this sequence closely as spectators we are not offered a position of stepping out. There are close up shots of the noose being tied uh, around, uh, being tightened around Dasan's neck. We see him being held forcefully and throttled to death while he shrieks in intense panic. We are pushed to partake in the violence of this game that is almost rendered ordinary because the camera is recording it. The, sequen com the sequence compels us to ask how our relation to violent events changes in the presence of the camera and non-stop image making technologies. Even in the end of this act, we see all the men guffaw and say, this is a real game, see how he hangs and what fun that was. And then the camera slowly withdraws from the space of the balcony. With the sound of the laughter of the men in the backdrop, it finds its way to other parts of the house. It stays focused on the TV that presents election analysis and the TV news report merges with the laughter. What follows is a slow paced sequence of the camera moving outwards from the house to show the empty overground surroundings. It's only after the slow meandering movements of the camera that we reach the front of the house and encounter the vision of the naked hanging body of Dasan. This frontal shot of the dead body transitions via a dissolve to a shot of the surrounding forest. We see the reflections of trees in the clear water and hear the sound of lapping water. The film ends on this note of eerie calm. The film's commentary on brutality and violence that can surface at any point, not as an aberration but as part of the ordinary in which we are all implicated in different ways, is conveyed through these formal dynamics. Blatant caste and gender violence appear here as encrusted and embedded in the fabric of sociality. The cinematic movements produces a surface in which these forms of violence surface and stare back at us. In the final part of this paper, I will move on to the analysis of the technological mediations in Kari, Black, a recent attempt in Malayalam cinema uh, to traverse the terrain of caste and representation in ways that disturb its, its set patterns. Scholars have argued that historically in Malayalam cinema, bodies marked as denigrated have been positioned as sites of voyeurism to be consumed by a disembodied spectator. In his recent analysis of uh, in his analysis of recent films uh, that range from Kammati Padam to Papilu Buddha, uh, P.K. Ratish observes that these films customize a liberal look on the Dalit and subaltern bodies marked as other via what he terms as digital hyperrealism. I quote him, if there is ethnographic violence in the realm of filmmaking, there is ethnographic voyeurism in the realm of film viewing, argues Ratish in his sharp criticism of the politics of representation in these films. I seek to analyze how Curry draws on the history of documentary and ethnographic investments of cinema, especially while framing folk rituals and customs and reworks it in provocative waves. Uh, the film is set up as a short sojourn of two men, Gopakumar, a businessman who settled in Oman and his business associate, Viral Tangal, who drive from southern to northern Kerala in order to visit Gopakumar's employer, the nation's family, and to give them money to conduct a ritual uh, Karingali uh, performance. The family is conducting this as an offering in the temple close to their house for Dinesh to get his visa uh, to continue with his employment in Oman. Uh, Gopakumar claims a dominant caste status and distances himself uh, from Dinesh and his family. There are verbal statements repeated in many instances in the film by different people including Dinesh's father and a temple functionary that caste hierarchies do not matter anymore. But this coexists with other embodied interactions in which caste pervades the stratified sensory disposition of everyday life. There is a sequence in the early part of the film uh, 
in which a man sticks a poster on the street side wall which says jadi vithugal vilpaneku uh, which literally translates as nutmeg seeds for sale but also means caste uh, for sale uh, signaling in an ironic fashion the caste order of modern kerala advertised for sale on a public wall alongside other political banners and flags the film takes a turn when gopakumar and bilal's car accidentally hit the cycle of the man who was supposed to do the ritual performance and they run around desperately trying to find another man to do the performance ayappan who is also a mazdoor uh, in the kerala state electricity board dons the costume and rubs curry on his face but multiple gaps and breaks surface as he violently discards and repeatedly runs away from this oracular role that is ascribed to him uh, the documentary idioms of the film its manner of recording conversations and interactions as the camera follows these men is disrupted via the figure of ayappan uh, whose figure injects a sense of collision and excess into the frame this is done primarily through through palpable shifts in cinematic style uh, for example in the sequence that introduces ayappan uh, prior to that the stable camera movements like uh, like as if it's an interview format but when ayappan comes uh, onto the screen uh, it shifts to a kind of shaky camera movements we hear drum beats and cymbals with the loud rendition of a song and the camera moves upwards and shows a view shows us a view of the sky followed by a long shot of an arid landscape ritual costumes are draped on a tree and rustle in the wind and then we get the first shot of ayappan who's applying curry on his face and looms large in the frame as a rebellious figure vocally abusing the caste structure in the sequence of the karingali performance the film records the ritual and also shows us the other recording devices in the space especially bilal with his uh, large phone who moves around a lot to capture an unknown practice that he watches with curiosity the presence of these two outsiders in the ritual space also draws attention to practices of viewing and our own position as spectators consuming uh, quote and quote folk culture but this stable distance is disturbed in the next sequence when an elephant runs amok and the crowd is scattered the pulsating movements of the train cuts across across the frame clearly marking a break in the rhythm of the film we now see the karingali lost and stranded uh, in a lonely stretch of dry land from the oracular performance in the earlier scene where the karingali was offering divine solutions to human suffering we now see his all too human body he wanders around carrying the burden of his ornaments and finally settles down in a crevice exhausted heaving and resting in stillness the ethnographic gaze of the camera is broken in these moments the long take that focuses is on the figure of the karingali produces movements and gestures clash of colors and sounds that pushes us into the realm of the absurd the fantastic and the uncanny these function as flashes of excess that disturb the everyday ordering of caste and produce figurations that cannot be easily folded back into known paradigms a feverish energy explodes in one of the final sequences in the film of the confrontation between ayappan and gopakumar the screen is filled with frantic movements and when i when asked the question what do you know about this ritual it is also a question to the viewers this is a scene of collision in which many viewers uh, come to terms uh, with our own lack of knowledge and we have to grapple with the incommensurability and difficulty of easy translations between multiple locations uh, curry disturbs existing visual and tactile regimes as the audience encounters blackness as excess uh, not easily available for consumption fred morton in his book black and blur writes that the central preoccupation of black radical tradition has been about spacing rupture what he calls perpetual cutting and incommensurability about process of some kind of not in between suspension and propulsion a certain arrhythmia this is a quote from uh, morton the and he's saying those movements that can, can then uh, disrupt the smooth flow of uh, narrative and history so for morton uh, you know forms like the lyric appearing in a narrative form or the interplay between writing and speech or uh, say oral express uh, kind of uh, oral forms being invoked in the visual so these kind of movements uh, that break formal uh, you know uh, barriers are uh, open product uh, chaotic yet productive movements uh, to narrate forms i suggest that in cinematic forms we need to locate and reflect on these suspended or propelled movements that break the regulated flow of space and time the question i would like to think further about is what is the 
political potential of this Eritrea? Do the animated movements of the cinematic form in the time of the digital, that interlinked feverish excess and eerie stillness, allow for an opening up of encrusted ways of inhabiting the world? In all these films that I have discussed here, Agam, Shavam, Urdu, Kali and Kari, we see cinema moving into a different tempo, often consciously consciously employed that dislodge us from our comfort zones. In many recent films that use digital technologies and consciously draw attention to the presence of the camera and other recording devices and also refer back to other traditions of representational practices, realism reappears in an edgy fashion with a capacity to unhinge the viewers. Many of these films shake our sense of equilibrium because of its formal strategies. The delirious play with movement and stillness that disturb the ordering of space and time. These films tap into the potential of the camera to look constantly and unflinchingly and absorb all acts and interactions, subjects and objects. And yet there is always something that escapes this all-pervasive look. Some traces that cannot be captured, some gestures that remain unreadable, modes of excess that erupt on the screen and blur stable ways of seeing. An extreme form of realism is intertwined with the spectral, the mythical and the fantastic in order to make film viewing an unhomely experience, one that dislodges us. In this uncanny terrains of media form, I think we can locate the potential uh, to create a new politics of spectatorship that can make us encounter the body differently. Thanks. There was a lot in that paper, um, but obviously it's for something that's um, flagging the the almost the potential of the uncanny. That right? your paper is actually very timely, right? That we're we're living in a world where ordinary life is continuously being created for us by images, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about. Um, and in that scenario, particularly to remediate the image mm -hmm. for for people and in a politically productive way mm -hmm. that I, that seems to be kind of the challenge of the times so almost when right? um, we're open for questions discussion. popular films also like uh, there is like say if you uh, the other film that I have thought about is the film Drishim which was you know remade in um, multiple languages but but if you look at uh, you know even Chapa Kurisha like there are many films in Malayalam that have this kind of I mean not just in Malayalam but if you're talking about Malayalam films uh, which uh, which seems to be very conscious of what ways in which uh, is technology reorganizing uh, you know our experiences of the private say or even a film like Varathan like you know where, where there's a certain uh, awareness 
awareness of you know what um, what we uh, think of as uh, in Hindi I think a film like LSD love sex or dhoka like you know a, a set of films like that which is then uh, thinking about how do or even the scene in Devdi where she's uh, you know recording herself nude for and sending the phone so there's a certain question I think which many popular films are also asking about how do these kind of new modes of mediation uh, shift our experience of the everyday or, or our experiences of the body of, of private privacy of conjugality like you know there's uh, uh, Sangeeta uh, Gopal writes about how uh, like uh, in lots of new Hindi cinema the home becomes the space of the horror right like and how technologies then become one of the ways in which you can stage horror like the TV or uh, you know or, or the CCTV cameras and the footage that uh, captures you know how if you insert that into a film how it could invoke like sometimes another kind of experience of viewing right like so I don't think it's a tendency only in uh, these films like you know it would be uh, uh, you know I I would like to place them with a larger set of films but I'm basically thinking about like you know how is cinema then uh, what is the status of cinema today in some senses right like where it's coexisting with all these other kind of media technologies and cinema then uh, has a long history of uh, being a form that has uh, you know allowed us to think about the subject, think about desire, uh, think about how we organize desires, right? So when today then uh, we also have all these other technologies uh, through which we are sort of constantly reorganizing uh, our own, uh, you know, uh, sense of the human, uh, the sense of the subject, uh, how is cinema dealing with that? Like, you know, how are they speaking back to each other? And I think it's an interesting thing, like why I find some a film like Shabam interesting is that it's doing that with in a certain very self-conscious fashion right but many films like popular films are also doing it like you know in like LSD for example was shot with three you know it gave us that sense of uh, we are watching three different uh, you know camera recording all the three stories right like so there is a way in which I think many new films are making us aware of how we look you know and how that changes what we see like the process of mediation in that sense right like Mm-hmm. So, 
Uh, that might be worth thinking about. I mean, in the sense that uh, cinema's often done this. It's not as if it's only today that we are referring to other technological forms, right? Like, so uh, you know, like the like you're saying, the tape recorder, for example, appears a lot. Like, there might be different functions it's serving. Like, sometimes you know, sometimes also uh, you know, it's also nostalgia. Sometimes you know, there's many reasons why technology comes in, right? Like, so I, uh, I mean, one I would have to see, like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, sometimes it's used to produce a certain, uh, you know, a certain. Dis sometimes it can allow a certain disruption, right? Like in, uh, you know, like uh, a, a song from an early uh, time coming in, or or an object like that from an early. Uh, so it's also it might be interesting to think about how objects circulate within cinema, right? Like why do we refer back to, uh, you know, certain object forms? How do they reappear in cinema? Like, you know, I mean, because uh, with uh, with painting, there is also like, like say a form like still life, right? Like uh, th there's a certain traditions of painting which gets very uh, interested in uh, painting objects, right? Like, but it's uh, interesting to think why cinema does that. Like, what kind of objects then enter into these media worlds and why they shift, right? Like the phone, for example, today there's so much of the uh, phones coming in. Phones as like uh, you know sometimes like very uh, threatening objects. What they can record like uh, you know some uh, but uh, another kind of object could appear very differently like uh, the TV can be a sort of part of a domestic uh, uh, what you say it can be accommodated much more so it might be interesting to think at what point of time what objects appear like yeah that might be uh, something worth thinking of because that's a different uh, question from the one that Pooja is pointing to, right? Like because there, you know, like a film like Red Road, and it's more like, uh, you know, what happens if the cinematic medium then takes on the point of view of uh, a certain technology of looking, right? Like so, two different, uh, you know, all these things are happening uh, simultaneously at different points of time, yeah. Also, uh, you know, when many of the discussions about, say, forms like horror, like, uh, you know, uh, talk about how the music is so key to it, right? Like, because the sound, when it's not attached, if you don't know the source or, you know, like, if it, it can often accentuate that feeling of, you know, like something, um, something is off or you know it can you can also work with a certain disjuncture between sound and image right like and uh, many films are using uh, you know new modes of using sound right like to uh, to create uh, uh, you, you know when i'm talking about this sense of unmooding or dislodging that the image does uh, it might be you know as a, for more further analysis i think i should look at how sound is working in there which i 
I don't really do and when I uh, you know like uh, one thing that I would really this is really new work so one thing I would like to do further is also actually look at how is the technology shifting right like because we broadly say it's shifted right like but act, what is the steps like how is uh, sound uh, you know production happening differently what does it allow for in terms of because it's uh, it's also like our experiences of uh, sound has shifted right like how we watch films have changed so when we talk about the digital it's not it, it's shifting in many levels right like there's the shifts in the production like both in terms of uh, you know the post production then there's also in terms of ex exhibition and reception right in all these then uh, sound plays an important uh, role right like so so yeah something that i would have to you know think more about look method method wise also i think paying attention to the sonic might be useful to especially uh, to see this kind of uh, you know uh, what affective role does the sound play and not just because it's always working together yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. How the body reacts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. Very simple question. I'm not going to answer it. I was just thinking about your title as a presentation. Also, think of why there's an encounter of the body with certain technologies and cinematic practices. Uh, there's also a constant, uh, you say, a phenomenal, well, it's a phenomenon, a phenomenon where the body continues to encounter these new technologies. Mm -hmm. So, so there's new techniques the body has to acquire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we want to as large as receptor level, but also some of these participating mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So what people would say there are always multiple technologies just all of driving mm -hmm. to actually drive these things. Mm -hmm. But we want to talk about not so much the encounter of the body, but the encounter of the technologies and the techniques of the body mm -hmm. and its relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in some ways then the question becomes like what is the body, you know, like in, in the present context, like I mean not in the present context at every point of time, I think that's why I find Gunning useful because he's not talking about the present moment, right, like he's talking about, uh, you know, a turn of the century, like, you know, early 20th century, like coming off the phone, early cinema, like that, the points of time where uh, the experience of viewing then, uh, a uh, uh, kind of makes the makes us experience the body differently right like so it's not you know it's not the technology and uh, you know it's not just encountering the body it's like you're saying it's it's a certain way in which then uh, the body becomes uh, refashioned or you know there's a new mode in which we are experiencing what is the body right like so that i think uh, is in is you know like there's a lot of uh, work like around early cinema around what photography did right like but it's an interesting question to think about it today I think like you know I mean not that people are not thinking about it but it would be useful to think about like because we are also like uh, you know uh, where do we encounter the body today right like it is via technology like we are constantly like uh, you know the, the our experiences of the sensory regime is being mediated via all kinds of technological forms right like so and, and the, the way we then imagine our uh, you know our performance of the everyday our performance of the event everything is also uh via thinking of technological mediation right like uh, you know uh, when we stage a protest for example right like we we cannot think of, about it without thinking about uh, you know what ways will it get uh, you know uh, uh, what ways will it get seen who will see it where will it reach right like so and there is no uh, nothing we are uh, orchestrating without technology right there's a way in which uh, you know the body then becomes uh, comes to being via a certain uh, 
you know interaction with different technological forms right like so then I, I think for me what's interesting about some of these films and clearly one would have to place them in a large set of films right is that they seems to be making us think about that encounter right like on the one level the film itself uh, is you know we are interacting with the film there's a certain space that it's producing and then uh, some of these films are also uh, offering us a certain uh, you know a, a certain set of uh, uh, kind of maybe there's a politics that the film itself is putting forward in thinking about so the film is making us think about what is technology right like so that's why I think some of that's why I pull together these films there are some other films I mean all, all in, in, in some ways like it's also a clash between technologies right like why is cinema taking on this task of commenting on other mediums like whether it's surveillance cameras whether it's CCTV cameras uh, whether it's digital phones right there's a certain way in which cinema today seems to be taking on that task of saying that uh, you know how do we think about the technology right like so so I'm wondering whether we can think via cinema instead of just thinking about cinema can we use this cinema to think about what is the technological today right like yeah thanks question right like I, I mean uh, like when uh, the question to this question that Shiju was also asking right like the whole question of how 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 do we experience this object right like off the camera like do we is there a certain way in which it's uh, you know it we are so uh, has it been so naturalized that we just think that it just records right or are there ways in which because at present we are encountering you know uh, there's a certain way in which the camera is sitting with many other technologies that is I think making us more acutely aware of this kind of uh, you know almost a uncanny power of the camera that it can absorb it can record it can replay but it can never you know there's always something that exceeds right like there's something sometimes also you know like say even uh, you know the Benjamin's discussion on uh, what the camera made possible right like he says it's that it shows us the world in it's like the optical unconscious like you know it makes us see in a way that we have never seen before what the eye cannot see right like, so it's both a certain kind of like uh, Gunning says that realism can be uncanny right like so it's both realist but there's also a certain kind of animation there's a certain uh, something that makes you feel almost uh, there's a certain bewilderment too right like that that kind of power of the camera and then can cinema itself allow us to think about that right like I mean uh, yesterday in my presentation in F2 I was talking about this uh, film that Ramini has made uh, called the tsunami and my camera where in some ways it's all about how his camera camera saw the tsunami right like and so the one footage in the camera that remained is not a footage it, the camera got destroyed in the tsunami and he was also caught in the wave and basically the film is all about the camera right it's almost like the camera's memories and there's one last recording that the camera did when it was caught in that wave right so it's almost as if the object then uh, is acquiring a certain a life of its own a certain uh, power to come back and haunt us you know so and what is that relationship right like yeah Oh yeah.
time for one more question. trying to you know uh, what happens to the i mean it it also seems to different films seems to be doing different things right like they are not all doing the same things i would say uh, for me like uh, actually agam like uh, you know um, i find the novel also a really interesting text like i have uh, you know yakshi because it is i would say one of the few uh, texts i've seen where really like the masculine body uh, becomes uh, you know de-reified let's say like it's really about the crisis of the masculine body the masculine body uh, which cannot perform right and that's the whole so it's not about the yakshi at all like it i mean it is about the yakshi but the yakshi as you know this rational scientific man uh, who is uh, you know who has this accident and then he becomes marked so he suddenly becomes a marked physically right like so in some senses like everything that we associate with masculinity as almost a disembodied you know upper caste masculine subject suddenly becomes a very marked body because of this disfiguration right like, so that it is an interesting text in that sense about uh, embodiment like you know about masculine embodiment and relating that to sexual uh, non you know his, uh, you know his failure to perform as and that then it's interesting that the yakshi becomes the device right so in what is i think what's interesting is that in the novel it's more about science and he is a scientist right in this film when it translates to a film in the present it beca he becomes an architect and then uh, it, rather than stage it via the whole crisis over science it becomes uh, it's almost as if the power of the technology becomes the device through which then the body is getting uh, you know uh, sort of so even when it's her spinning like she's the one who's dizzily spinning but he's the one who's falling apart so it's a very interesting question as to how the film manages to do that not so much via dialogue or you know like the film that the novel because the novel has his diary entries you know it, it's a very verbal form right here it's really via the cinematography and i think via sound also which i would really like to think about more like even in the dizzy you know when she's 
spinning the sound is really an important element but but so in that sense the technological becomes the uh, you know it, its capacity somehow to derail us is sort of used to then uh, you know both uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, destabilize the home like the conjugal space but also the masculine body right so that's what's happening there uh, but in shavam it's a dead body right like so that's a very i mean actually like what you do the man is not there right so there is a certain way which then uh, you know it's not so much about encountering the body but it's also about encountering uh, practices of recording death right like and and there again it's i think it's histories of technology that's coming in like the still photography the references to painting the references to histories of photography and death right all that is sort of brought in to then uh, kind of uh, you know kind of make us think about how do we uh, you know encounter each other uh, what is what is technology doing like our body is actually meeting or not like you know so it becomes much more about uh, that uh, zone right and, and in curry i think it's far more like really using that concept you know the the performance uh, form right like uh, of the you know putting the curry on your face like so there is a certain way in which uh, you drawing on ritual performances to then so it's not just the cinematic that's brought in it's also there the movements like what i talk about but also these histories of performance that's brought in to here destabilize both the upper caste uh, male body because it's also this men who are looking at it. it's not just uh, the performing body which is the dalit man's body but the lookers on lookers body i think in both urvudustakali and in kari because in those i think it's far more talk making us aware of our location as uh, you know casted uh, viewers right like and, and what does it mean then you know like say to watch the ending of urdu sakali where a group of apakas men are actually hanging one of their friends to death in all in the name of a game and what how, what does it mean so there i think the you know it's our own uh, you know the positioning of the viewer that is being taken on in both kari and uh, uh, you know um, uh, what you say urdu sakali so they working in different ways but there is a certain uh, you know attention to practices of uh, you know how bodies uh, encounter technology and how bodies encounter each other that they are sort of forcing us to think about and why are the formal is what i'm saying trying to say that i mean in the sense that studying the aesthetic forms might allow us to think about some of these questions that it's not that aesthetic shifts are simply happening but they become necessary right like uh, yeah so that's good i think yeah okay, okay. um i'm going to use the privilege of the chair to say a last thing which just was inspired by what you were saying just now that um would it be uh, appropriate maybe to think about the cinema as we think about the novel for example in literature right as this on the whole form which is able to comment on and use various other technological mm-hmm. forms right and and comment on them comment on itself mm-hmm. right and that maybe that makes the i mean from your argument it seems like that might be uh, one way to you know to think about the importance of the cinema at this moment when we're surrounded by um and i do also want to uh, flag the because you use the idea of the uncanny right and both benjamin and freud do actually think the visual is a very special kind of engagement with the world right that there is sound there is and there are obviously technologies of the body which are uh, distributed but the visual has somehow a special kind of importance for all them so I, that maybe some is something that you are also focusing on in that way right? that somehow seeing being seen really is is the most important uh, part of the camera work and uh, of this mediation that you're talking about okay thank you so much everyone for your questions for the discussion i believe we have to be rewarded with tea after this so thank you thank you thank you <laughs>